Bueno, a ver, quizás ya pregunto. Ya está. Sí, <laughs> Good evening and welcome everybody to uh, this podcast, this live uh, event that we're doing here this evening to update people about the current situation of the El Mosote massacre case. Uh, we're very glad to give you all a welcome here to Crystal Sal's uh, meeting room here. I'm joined this afternoon with my colleague David Morales, who is the lead attorney on the Almosote case. Uh, and we're also lucky to have uh, the support of our other colleague, Addy, who is going to be translating for us. This is going to be a, an attempt at making a hybrid event tonight. We're going to be mixing Spanish and English, but hopefully uh, being able to communicate to everybody. Um, I wanted to start by bringing everybody up to speed about the case itself, reminding us where we've come the trajectory that we the path we walked down. Uh, and then we're going to turn to Dami and, and ask a few questions. And we'll open it up after that to questions from the audience who's joining us. Again, we're really grateful for everybody to connect. And we know uh, you have busy lives. And there's nothing more fun than talking about crimes against humanity and war crimes on a Friday evening. Uh, but it's an important time and it's an important moment uh, in the case and in the country itself. So just to remember a little bit what we're talking about, uh, the Mosote massacre is considered to be one of the largest uh, massacres committed on the American continent in modern times. Uh, it's a case that happened over 40 years ago. Uh, there were over a thousand people killed. Uh, the all of them were civilians. The more majority were children. It's a case that's been verified by international organizations, including the United Nations. The Inter-American Human Rights uh, Court has uh, uh, made a sentence on it, uh, as well as the case has been verified by the Truth Commission at the end of the Salvadoran Civil War. The, the case was brought for the first time before the court in 1990 by the victims uh, and survivors of the El Masote massacre. And David was part of the legal team that, that went with them to the court. The, the, the case was quickly frozen uh, with the 1992 amnesty law, uh, which provided protection for war crimes committed during the, the Salvadoran armed conflict. Uh, in the 2016, the Salvadoran Supreme Court overruled the amnesty law uh, and, and ordered that the cases, all the cases, be reopened. Uh, this represented a new opportunity for justice, uh, and on, on, so on, we, were on, we were not expecting it, but uh, a new opportunity for justice in this historic case. Uh, there are 33 military officers uh, from the armed forces of uh, that, that period that are being uh, have been arraigned and, and accused uh, for a diversity of national and international crimes. Uh, the majority of the members, or the, the most important cases, include members of the Salvadoran Military High Command. Uh, since the 2016 amnesty law, Crystal Sal has been working together with uh, our partner uh, sister organization, Tutela Legal, which is the historic human rights organization that's been accompanying the case. Uh, and since that time, we've been able to grow our legal team to seven people. And that's the team that David leads. Uh, the case has been uh, moving forward to what would be like the discovery phase for over five years. Uh, and our legal team has been able to bring forward uh, a diversity of forensic, anthropological, historic, testimonial evidence. Uh, and in reality, it's one of the largest cases to ever be seen in the Salvadoran criminal justice system. Uh, in more recent days, we've had a series of setbacks. Uh, we've weathered uh, over the course of five years, several appeals and several other attempts to derail the case uh, through legal instruments. But more recently, uh, the case has come under political attack. Uh, the president of the uh, of El Salvador, Kelly, ordering the Minister of Defense to block the judges' uh, inspections of the military archives is one example. Uh, and perhaps more gravely, uh, the uh, action by the Legislative Assembly in El Salvador order uh, that all judges over the age of 60 or with more than 30 years 
of service uh, in the justice system cease uh, immediately in their functions. Uh, this uh, pretty much overnight uh, excluded the judge who's been overseeing the trial of Almost Sote case for five years from continuing uh, in that role. Uh, this implies a major setback for the victims who have already waited for years for justice uh, and is representative of a, a moment in El Salvador uh, where democratic rule of law is suffering a serious setback. It's the position of our organization that currently El Salvador is no longer a democracy or being ruled within the framework of the constitution. So this is the complex context in which we are here tonight sharing with you about uh, the trial. I think it's important to remember also uh, the trial in the context of a broader history uh, in which uh, El Mosote is a part uh, of a struggle for victims around the world uh, to, to fight against the assumption of impunity. Uh, impunity, we understand, is an exercise of power. Uh, people in power assume that they can do what they like with the people, to do what they like with the resources of the people, uh, and that they would not ever be held to account. When we work for justice crimes like these, like almost what it's not because we believe that we can stop uh, war crimes from ever happening again, but that we can challenge this assumption of impunity. That in working for accountability in one case, uh, we can begin to break down that assumption the people who exercise power can do what they like with the people and do what they like, what they like with their resources. Uh, in this sense, uh, El Mosote has been the subject of confronted power in El Salvador for 40 years. Uh, and recently with Dave David, uh, we were reflecting on the current situation. And then David said to me that uh, not the amnesty law or the recent coup can set back the struggle for justice. So that's where we are. Uh, I'm going to turn out to the lead, turn the microphone to the lead, and we're going to begin with a few questions uh, so that we can better understand the context. And I'm going to ask the questions to the lead uh, in English and Spanish, and we, that we will answer with a translation. So, David, tell us a little bit more about the current situation in Salvador. Talk to us a little bit about how the political circumstances in the country are now having an impact in the El Mosote trial. Gracias, no, un saludo a la audiencia que nos sigue esta tarde. Eh, bien, El Salvador tiene una situación excepcional, una situación en la que el régimen actual del presidente Bukele ha profundizado su golpe contra el poder judicial y su último movimiento obviamente ha sido la destitución masiva de jueces en todo el país uno de ellos el juez Jorge Guzmán quien llevaba adelante el caso de Nelson. Uh, thank you first of all and uh, good evening uh, hi to everyone um, first of all we would say that El Salvador is living an exceptional situation um, that the presidential regimen um, has really dealt a tough blow against the against the judicial system, and the first uh, one of the major steps in this was the dismissal of judges, um, in primarily of uh, Judge Guzman, in the Mazote case. El proceso judicial del Mazote se encontraba en su fase de instrucción, que es la fase de recopilación de pruebas avanzada en un 95%. Um, the judicial case is, was found, or at the time, is actually currently in the discovery phase, and we say that it's about 95% advanced through that phase. Es decir, que estaba a las puertas de que el caso avanzara a su etapa final, la etapa plenaria, que culmina con la sentencia definitiva. Era un acto eh, que estaba por venir en las próximas semanas eh, por parte del de, de juez Guzmán, quien a, aún debía eh, culminar algunas diligencias importantes de la instrucción. Um, the phase, the, uh, the case was at the, um, at the doors, about at the doors of the plenary phase, um, which is the phase of final sentencing. 
Um, and we were hoping to move on to this phase in the next few weeks with uh, Judge Guzman, um, which is just a uh, culmination of everything that has been found in the discovery phase. Eh, aún se encontraban, dije, pendientes algunas eh, eh, diligencias importantísimas como las declaraciones de peritas especializadas que han entregado su informe al juez. Las peritas debían dar testimonio eh, presencial en temas tan importantes como la violencia sexual contra mujeres y niñas en el caso, eh, un informe especializado de antropología social, eh, así como eh, la, la experta en archivos históricos que ha entregado un amplio informe. Esas eh, expertas debían declarar ante el tribunal eh, y esas son las diligencias que estarían pendientes antes de pasar a la etapa plenaria. A few key processes were um, still needed to be completed and still need to be completed in the case. Um, what kind of hangs or what hasn't been completed are testimonies of uh, expert witnesses, specifically testimony on sexual violence, um, testimony from an expert witness in social anthropology, um, and also the report that has been completed by um, an expert witness on the historical archives. Um, and so all of these witnesses still need to testify. Um, and have it been unable to do so. El proceso no está cerrado, sigue abierto, pero se ve afectado eh, profundamente por la destitución inconstitucional del juez Guzmán que ha ocurrido con las recientes reformas a la ley de la carrera judicial. Um, the case is still open. We wouldn't say that the, the case has been closed. Um, but it's been severely affected by the dismissal of the judges um, and uh, needs, to be, needs to be completed. So, uh, David, you mentioned, let's go back for a second and talk a little bit more about uh, these attacks on the judicial system and the role of Judge Guzman. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, on the 1st of May, the Legislative Assembly through an unconstitutional means and using force uh, through the police and the armed forces uh, overthrew the Constitutional Chamber of the uh, Salvadoran Supreme Court. And then uh, in these more recent events, they've been able to purge hundreds of judges from different levels uh, in different tribunals in the country. Uh, you presented the case, the uh, Masote case, in 1990. Uh, what is it different about the role of Judge Guzman in his presiding over the case? And I'm asking because one of the justifications for this recent purging of judges was that the president said that these were corrupt judges, that this was a matter of counter corruption. It seems arbitrary that the uh, indicator of corruption is that you're over the age of 60, but as Judge Guzman, el discurso de que han sido destituidos los jueces por corrupción es un discurso falso del presidente Bukele. Eh, lo que se está tratando de hacer es eh, asaltar el judicial, tomarlo, controlarlo por el poder político. Y en lo personal pienso que el caso de Mosote era un objetivo del régimen, paralizar, afectar eh, el avance del proceso judicial del Mosote, obviamente con fines de impunidad y de protección a los responsables de la masacre. Um, the discourse, the concept that judges or that the judges that ha have been dismissed because of corruption is a false discourse. It's untrue um, by the Bukele administration. Um, basically, it's a step towards trying to control the power um, and paralyze any advances in the case. Um, and in general, it has uh, uh, ends, ends in impunity. Cuando en 1990 las víctimas presentaron su denuncia, encontraron eh, un sistema judicial y particularmente un juez eh, que tuvo a cargo el caso, 
que hizo esfuerzos muy grandes por detener el caso, por obstaculizarla, por impedir la investigación. Esta fue la historia de los primeros tres años que culminó con una ley de amnistía. A pesar de eso, eh, la lucha de las víctimas permitió que se presentara importante prueba testimonial y se iniciaron también las exhumaciones ya en el marco del proceso de paz. Pero luchando contra un eh, tribunal que era adverso a las víctimas y que trataba de, de impedir el avance del caso. Um, when the victims first presented their case in 1990, they found themselves um, in, uh, coming up against a judicial system that made great efforts to impede um, impede their their. Uh, their case um, in the first three years this is what they were dealing with and this ended in the amnesty law um, and so as they were working towards um, presenting their case um, they, they came up against all of these challenges a diferencia de la experiencia anterior eh, el juez guzmán eh, asumió las obligaciones que estableció la Sala de lo Constitucional cuando en 2016 declaró totalmente inconstitucional la Ley de Amnistía General. Uh, the difference between uh, the current or the difference between Judge Guzman and the way that the case was treated beforehand is that Judge Guzman um, really took upon himself all the obligations of the case um, when he assumed the case in 2016. Um, he presented the case to the um, constitutional ch the constitutional chamber um, and it, or the, the constitutional chamber, chamber, excuse me, declared that the amnesty law was unconstitutional um, and they were able to rebegin the case. El juez Guzmán ha dado muestras de ser un juez imparcial e independiente. Ha respetado el debido proceso para todas las partes, inclusive los imputados y ha permitido la participación de las víctimas como establecen los estándares internacionales de derechos humanos. Um, judge Guzman has proven himself to be an independent and impartial judge. He's given the victims the opportunity, he's collected um, evidence, he's given the victims the opportunity to um, present themselves and he's proved himself to be um, impartial on all fronts ha dado trámite a las peticiones de todas las partes y esto ha permitido avanzar las investigaciones hasta el punto de estar cerca de la fase plenaria como he mencionado. He's followed up with all of the cases, um, giving them due absolute due process and this is what has allowed us to arrive at the beginning of the plenary phase. Basado en la evidencia y la ley declaró que la masacre del Mozote y sitios aledaños constituía un crimen de lesa humanidad y un crimen de guerra. Uh, based in the law, he's been able to prove that the case um, is, uh, represents a war crime. Ante la negativa de entregar documentos militares fundamentales por parte del gobierno anterior y el gobierno del presidente Bukele, es el único juez eh, que tuvo la valentía de ordenar inspecciones en archivos históricos de unidades militares. Y justamente es lo que ya usted mencionaba, ¿no? Eh, diligencias que fueron eh, bloqueadas por el presidente Bukele y su ministro de Defensa y que llevaron a ataques personales públicos del presidente contra el pueblo. Uh, Juez Guzmán o Judge Guzmán es el único juez que ha conseguido garantizar acceso o garantizar um, evidencia basada en military archives. Um, and this is exactly what Noah was referring to in that um, he has been in an attempt to uh, access these archives, he's faced personal attacks from the president. Eh, agregaría eh, sobre la pregunta que no hay ningún indicio de corrupción ni de acción indebida o ilegal en las actuaciones del pueblo humano. La defensa intentó atacarlo con muchos argumentos y tribunales superiores eh, se pronunciaron declarando que todas las actuaciones del juez eran totalmente legales, legales apegadas a la Constitución en diferentes oportunidades. Um, referring to what Noah said, um, 
Judge Guzman was able to guarantee um, complete impartiality. Um, despite the attacks, he was able to guarantee that um, no, no corruption in the case. And this was also uh, proven and verified by higher courts. Certainly one of the ironic tragedies of this reform that ended up purging judges over the age of 60 is that it affects directly the victims of El uh, by removing one of the first judges in the history of the Salvador justice system who didn't act corruptly when it comes to cases of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Uh, but Dali, you said earlier that you think that one of the motives for the measure of the purging of the judges was precisely the setback uh, or block the Mosote case. Why is this case that's 40 years old of such importance to this government? Why is this case important to a president who's 40 years old himself, and who says he's the first post-war president, and that he's trying to turn the page of Salvadoran history? Why is this case so uncomfortable for this government? Bien, eh, el caso del Mosote representa un desafío importante para la justicia y, y a los gobiernos que han enfrentado el proceso judicial. Eh, porque es un caso eh, que demuestra, que ha probado que los sistemáticos y masivos crímenes eh, contra la humanidad que se perpetraron en el conflicto armado eh, se perpetraron como una política de terror de Estado que se planificó y se ejecutó desde el alto mando de la Fuerza Armada de El Salvador. This case represents a challenge um, to the justice system and the government because this case is an example of how um, war crimes and um, violence in during during the war were actually committed as uh, by by the state itself, um, and so it basically it proves that this crime was committed based on orders from the higher echelons of the Salvadoran military. El ex ministro de defensa al momento el ministro de defensa al momento de la masacre Guillermo García junto a otros poderosos oficiales dirigieron una política de exterminios desapariciones y torturas. En aquel momento fueron encubiertos, como se ha demostrado en el juicio, por el gobierno de los Estados Unidos de aquella época. Eh, es un caso que representa el privilegio del poder militar en El Salvador. Un privilegio que a pesar de los cambios eh, del proceso de paz y los años eh, de democracia formal en El Salvador sigue, sigue aquí. Um, the, so the, the Minister of Defense at the time, uh, the Minister Guillermo Garcia, um, and other people at, in, the, um, in those areas of the military, in the higher echelons of the military, um, really executed a, a policy of extermination, of disappearance, and of torture. Um, and these actions were covered by the government of the United States. Um, and this is a privilege, this basically just shows a privilege that's still enjoyed by the Salvadoran military. Todos los altos mandos de la Fuerza Armada de El Salvador, desde eh, el, la firma de la paz hasta el actual gobierno del presidente Bukele, han bloqueado las investigaciones de los crímenes de guerra y han protegido a los militares que fueron responsables de estos crímenes durante el conflicto armado. All of the higher, um, higher military command from the signing of the peace accords to the current government of Bukele um, have blocked and protected anyone that had been involved um, at the time during at the case of the Mazote. El presidente Bukele está incrementando el militarismo en El Salvador mucho más que los gobiernos anteriores. Está dando un rol político a la Fuerza Armada y a la Policía Nacional Civil, e incluso eh, la Policía Civil fue un instrumento de fuerza para imponer su golpe de Estado el 1 de mayo. Esta, este poder 
político que se está dando a los militares, eh, evidencia eh, que el alto mando probablemente actual tiene un, una capacidad de eh, imponer su interés de seguir estableciendo la impunidad sobre este tipo de crimen. The current administration is increasing military power in the country. Um, he's given, or the, the current government has given a political role to the military and also the national police. And the national police were actually used as uh, an instrument of power or um, were used in the, um, the, the auto coup d'etat um, that occurred in May. Um, and this basically just shows that the higher military powers in El Salvador are becoming increasingly politicized um, and continue to be protected. Just want to uh, recap a little bit here uh, before I ask the next question. Um, we've been talking about some complex issues here in El Salvador. In September, the Legislative Assembly it is, has a supermajority the party of the president has a supermajority and has demonstrated a way of legislating uh, in which there is no debate. Uh, oftentimes, uh, legislators arrive uh, for legislative sessions uh, and they don't even know what vote laws that they're going to vote on. They modify the agenda the day of. Uh, laws are in the majority presented by the, uh, the president's office uh, and they're passed almost immediately, as I said, without debate. In September, the, in August, the reform of the judicial careers law that we've been mentioning was passed by this legislature. It's considered to be an unconstitutional action because the Salvador legislature doesn't have the power to regulate internal affairs of the court. It's one of the principles of separation of power. Nonetheless, they usurp this power, this authority, and pass this law that would obligate uh, over 200 judges to be destituted from their, their sat from their from their uh, courts, and when the the president of the Supreme Court began to implement this law, it became quickly evident that the El Sote case uh, would be an uncomfortable issue. The judge uh, would be removed, and this is one of the highest profile cases uh, in the country right now. Uh, and so, to as a basically that we would see. Uh, the president of the Salvadoran Supreme Court offered to Judge Guzman an alternative. Uh, on that, I mean, could you explain to us the alternative that the, the Supreme Court president offered to Judge Guzman so that he could continue with the case? La posición de la Corte Suprema del Salvador es sumamente lamentable. Ha sido una posición de sumisión es de sometimiento total al poder político del presidente de Chile y su supermayoría en la Asamblea Legislativa. Um, the position of the Supreme Court in El Salvador is uh, rather sad. It represents a position of complete submission um, and giving in to the supermajority that's held in the Legislative Assembly. El decreto eh, de reformas a la ley de la carrera de judicial es eh, totalmente inconstitucional, tanto por el procedimiento eh, que se usó para aprobarlo, como por el fondo de ese decreto. Um, the decree that, um, that declared that it was all right to dismiss judges, the, the, this judicial careers decree that we've been talking about is completely un unconstitutional, um, both through the process through which it was carried out and also the basis of, um, of the, the, the legal ba basis that was used to justify it. La Corte Suprema debió inaplicar ese decreto eh, que aprobó el, el presidente Bukele eh, después de votarlo en la Asamblea. Y eh, en lugar de esto, la Corte se convirtió, como se ha denunciado, en eh, una entidad que es nada más una operadora política de este asalto del ejecutivo al judicial. And the way that the Bukele administration applied to the court to, um, to or utilize the court to realize this, the, this, this decree um, has transformed the courts into an instrument, a completely a political instrument of the Bukele administration. El decreto solo deja dos caminos 
a los jueces de 60 años o que cumplían 30 años de servicio. Uno de ellos es el cese inmediato, lo que equivale a una destitución ilegal y constitucional. Um, there are two, basically two pathways that this decree allows um, for either uh, judges that are over the age of 60 or have served for 30 years um, or over 30 years, one of which is just immediate termination, which is completely unconstitutional. La otra opción es someterse a un régimen de disponibilidad eh, que deja a los jueces que acepten eh, esta posibilidad con una independencia totalmente vulnerada. The second option is to be entered onto a list of availability, um, which completely compromises the independence of these judges. Las ofertas del presidente de la Corte al juez Guzmán de continuar en un régimen de disponibilidad que el juez eh, no solicitó eh, era una posibilidad que ni siquiera está contemplada en el decreto de destitución masiva. The um, option to enter into a list of availability is an option that wasn't even considered um, in, in any original decrees having to do with um, dismissal of judges. La posición del juez Guzmán es una posición de mucha dignidad coherente con la Constitución eh, porque él no acepta quedarse bajo un régimen de trabajo que es evidentemente inconstitucional y en el cual, en la práctica, eh, tendrá eh, su independencia sumamente comprometida. The position in which um, Judge Guzman has found himself um, is a position of complete, um, or he has chosen a, a, a decision of complete dignity um, to, instead of staying under um, an unconstitutional, um, or continuing to act in an unconstitutional context, Um, he uh, has refused to, um, to act without independence. La Asociación de Víctimas del Mozote ha dado un pleno respaldo a esta posición eh, ética del juez eh, y eh, le ha dado eh, su total eh, eh, apoyo en, en esta posición de eh, respeto y coherencia a la legalidad y a la constitución. The Association of Victims of um, El Mazote have backed up completely um, the decision of Juez Guzman, of Judge Guzman, to, um, to reject the, um, the decree that was made by the Bukele administration. Oh, that was going to be my next question, how did the victims react? But just to recap again, because these are complicated issues. Uh, the Supreme Court president offered to Judge Guzman the opportunity to continue uh, overseeing, presiding over the trial. Uh, and, and then after that trial was over, he would then uh, be put on that list of availability, which is basically uh, a way of controlling judges uh, without guaranteeing that they actually have any jurisdiction. Uh, and the judge, re he rejected that offer on the basis that the action Uh, or the impact of uh, the judicial uh, reforms uh, were so grave, the existence of separation of powers, the, the institutions of democracy in that country, that he, that accepting that offer uh, would make him in some way complicit with an action uh, that is supremely grave for the, the, the country and the democracy. And the, and the response from the victims of El Mosote is really a, It's amazing. It's an act of solidarity. It's a group of people who've been fighting for 40 years to have justice. And on the eve of practically the final stage of uh, the trial, after five years uh, of struggle, uh, they said in a, in a press statement that they understand that their situation uh, is similar to the situation of thousands of others of, of Salvadorans who are victims of violence who through this uh, purging of judges have been denied access to justice. Uh, and so in an act of solidarity with all victims, uh, they put the cause of justice of all people above the, their own pursuit of justice, which is something that's uh, pretty pretty amazing uh, in these moments. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit more about 
the reaction of the victims uh, uh, in response to the sacking of the judge and the solidarity that they have expressed with other victims. Sí, eh, eh, realmente la posición de la víctima eh, es una posición eh, que yo entiendo eh, es tomada eh, como las otras posiciones anteriores de ella en el caso. Es una posición de exigir un juicio justo, reglas claras, respeto a la Constitución y a la garantía del debido proceso. Uh, the position that the victims have taken in, the, in this case um, is a position that I understand. Um, it's very much like the position that they've taken um, in, in the past. Um, regarding the case um, having to do with clear, um, clear rules um, and transparency. Eh, de esta forma, eh, las víctimas pudieron comprobar durante cinco años que ha, que ha durado el caso de instrucción que el juez Guzmán era un juez imparcial, eh, que respetaba el debido proceso y que incluso daba trámite a las eh, solicitudes de la defensa de los militares o rechazaba algunas solicitudes de la acusación particular que, que realizábamos. Es decir, era un juez que actuaba eh, con imparcialidad eh, y siguiendo las reglas de un juicio justo. Esa experiencia creo que ha sido eh, muy importante para las víctimas. The decision of the victims to uh, support Judge Guzman and his decision um, backs up and completely proves the impartiality of um, Judge Guzman, um, his respect of due process, um, and the way that he um, he completely uh, completely rejects uh, corruption. Um, it shows that he's a judge that that acts, that takes action, um, and it's been a very important experience for the victims in the case. Quizás la experiencia de un juez imparcial eh, es una experiencia común y generalizada en otros países con sistemas judiciales eh, independientes, pero en El Salvador es la primera experiencia en que víctimas de un crimen de guerra que han buscado la justicia tantos años, tenía contacto con esta posibilidad, la de un juez que hacía cumplir la ley y llevaba adelante un proceso judicial contra, crimen, contra criminales de guerra. Perhaps access to impartial judges is something that's normalized um, in other countries, but in El Salvador, this is the first experience in which um, victims that have fought for justice for so many years um, have been able to have contact um, with, uh, with a judge that's able to impartially fight their case. Por eso las víctimas eh, tienen plena claridad que ha sido violado su derecho de acceso a un juez imparcial, a su juez natural, eh, y reconoce que las reformas, como lo han expresado en sus comunidades públicos, las reformas son un golpe al judicial que golpea también su derecho de acceso a la justicia y respalda en esta posición del juez Guzmán de no prestarse a legitimar una reforma claramente inconstitucional y violatoria del derecho de las víctimas a tener acceso a, a su juez, a sus jueces naturales. Um, the victims recognize that, uh, that this is an opportunity for them or that they've had access to, um, and they respect that they've had access to an impartial and independent judge um, for their case. Um, and they recognize that uh, the, that by backing up um, the decision of Judge Guzman not to lend himself to a, a corrupt system or a severely compromised system um, is, uh, allows them to continue this uh, path towards impartiality. David, I wanted to just make a comment because we've been talking a lot about uh, about the attacks on the justice system 
uh, we mentioned two specific moments. One was the first of May, where the legislature uh, sacked the, uh, the constitutional court, and the second one being uh, in this pretty massive purging of a third of the judges in the Salvadoran uh, justice system. Crystal saw uh, in representation of three of the magistrates that were uh, that were sacked on the first of May uh, presented. Uh, a case before the Inter-American Human Rights Court uh, in defense of those judges uh, in the constitutionality of that action, as well as Crystal Sal uh, is representing 63 judges who were purged uh, in this most recent action that we've been talking about. Uh, I mentioned that just to, to bring in a little bit broader context uh, of the struggle for justice uh, on the ground in El Salvador. Uh, not only do the victims uh, of violence uh, have they been violated in their right to have access to justice, uh, but perhaps equally as concerning uh, as critical voices are attacked by the regime, uh, the right to defense or the right to an impartial trial or the right to due process uh, or fair treatment while incarcerated are rights that we see uh, being eroded or violated every single day. Um, one, I want to make a little shift here. We have some questions that came in uh, through email and on our chat. And if there are more questions, you can keep them coming. We'll try and get to as many as possible. Uh, but Dami, there were two questions here uh, that were related to what will happen next with the trial. What are the risks for the trial? And is there, there was a question here about, is there a possibility, what would incomplete justice for the victim look like? Entonces, <laughs> Eh, los avances, los logros en cuanto a la justicia, la verdad, ¿con qué implica cómo se ve una justicia incompleta en este contexto? Bien, el caso, como decía, está en una incertidumbre legal. El juez eh, natural, destituido y constitucional, la Corte ha nombrado una nueva jueza eh, para el caso, eh, que ya eh, ha asumido la, la conducción del tribunal. The case right now is in a state of uncertainty um, with the destitution of the dismissal of the independent judge, um, Judge Guzman, that was assigned to the case. Um, and a new judge has been assigned to the case. Eh, esto eh, eh, significa que si el decreto eh, que el decreto que dio lugar a la destitución del juez Guzmán es inconstitucional, todos los actos, todos los acuerdos derivados de ese decreto eh, también son inconstitucionales. Eh, y esto pone en duda eh, la constitucionalidad en el nombramiento de la nueva jueza. Y en el futuro, eh, los actos de la nueva jueza podrían ver comprometida su, su validez por esta razón. This means that because, um, because of the decree that dismissed Judge Guzman, all of the acts um, committed now moving forward uh, could be considered unconstitutional because of the fact that this this decree that dismissed Judge Guzman um, was considered con unconstitutional. Um, this could potentially imply that the new judge that's been assigned to the case, um, this that the fact that she was assigned is an unconstitutional act, and also it will call into question all of the acts associated or all the actions taken by this new judge moving forward. Pero eh, el caso no está cerrado, el caso sigue en trámite, el decreto eh, no es un decreto que eh, cerraba eh, el caso o que imponía una amnistía sobre el caso. The case is not closed, the case is still open, um, the case is still in process, 
Um, and the decree also um, is something that, that remains open and remains in process. La nueva jueza debería, debería tramitar eh, las diligencias pendientes, eh, las solicitudes eh, de diligencias que aún hagan las partes eh, y dar paso a, a la elevación a la fase final del plenario. The new judge should follow up um, and continue the process um, of, of what was what was uncompleted in the case. Perdón, David, me puede me puede repetir, por favor. La jueza debería seguir eh, tramitando las diligencias pendientes y las diligencias que soliciten las partes y luego pasar eh, a la elevación del plenario que prácticamente estaba ya muy cercana. The new judge should um, continue all of the all of the process in the case um, and present what has been found to and in the next in the next phase, which is the plenary phase of the case. Eh, nosotros como eh, acusación particular todavía seguimos valorando opciones de eh, acciones legales uh, a nivel del, del Salvador a nivel interno para tratar de revertir la destitución del pueblo humano. Um, we're continuing to evaluate options um, and actions, legal actions that we could take um, on a national level to try to reverse the, the dismissal of Judge Guzman. A nivel del sistema interamericano de derechos humanos hay acciones iniciadas eh, como la que usted ya mencionaba que ha impulsado Cristo Sara. Um, on the inter on the inter-American level, um, having to do with human rights, um, we've already um, evaluated a little bit, also as an as an institution, Christosol. Eh, sin embargo, eh, eh, las víctimas están decididas a eh, mantener su lucha por la justicia. Um, nevertheless, the victims are ready to continue their their fight for justice. Eh, ya eh, se tuvo que enfrentar una amnistía que fue impuesta por 23 años. They already had to um, come up against and fight the, the amnesty law that was in place for 23 years. Y me parece que con la misma fuerza y dignidad que las víctimas enfrentaron ese atropello de la amnistía, van a enfrentar ahora eh, el golpe de, de, de Estado, el golpe contra el judicial. And I believe that with the same force that they, um, with which they went against the amnesty law, um, they'll be able to go against this, um, the, the, the coup d'etat um, and the, this new decree. Y eh, sostendremos el litigio a pesar de las circunstancias complejas y las incertidumbres. And we'll continue um, the strategic lit litigation um, even in the midst of all of the complications and uncertainties. El caso del Mozote contiene pruebas que ha sentado precedentes importantísimos eh, para El Salvador, independientemente del, del fin de este proceso. Um, the Mozote case has um, made some amazing advancements um, and will serve as an example, um, no matter what the end of this case is. El funcionamiento de la Fuerza Armada desde su más alto mando como un aparato organizado criminal que perpetró sistemáticamente crímenes de guerra y crímenes de lesa humanidad. The, um, the functioning of showing the functioning of high echelons of the Salvadoran um, military um, and the way that they protected people who were incriminated in war crimes. La estrategia deliberada de exterminios de población civil eh, durante varios años en el conflicto armado como estrategia contra insurgentes. The strategic protection um, of, per, perdón, David, una vez más. La estrategia de exterminio de población civil eh, por la Fuerza Armada durante varios años eh, como un objetivo militar de contra insurgencia showing the, um, an, the process or the, the, the policy of extermination um, against insurgencies that served as an official policy for many years. El encubrimiento del gobierno de los Estados Unidos 
eh, sobre estas prácticas y la protección eh, a los responsables, como el ministro Guillermo García. The, um, the hiding and the covering of these actions by the U.S. government um, and the protection of specific um, individuals such as Guillermo García. Estamos convencidos que se incluso eh, cerraran el caso de manera ilegal y la nueva jueza eh, impulsara ese objetivo de cerrar el caso, lucharíamos nuevamente por otra reapertura. We're convinced that in the event that the new judge um, fights to close this case, that will fight, will keep on fighting to, to uh, have it remain open. La Constitución, el derecho internacional, eh, la justicia eh, están del lado de las víctimas en este tema. The, con the Constitution, international law, um, it, everything is, is on the side of the victims in this process. Y también la enorme prueba que ya está incorporada en el caso. And also the, um, the standard of the, the evidence that's already incorporated into the case. We have a, a question that we from our friend Ben Ben Chap at, at Stanford University. Uh, she asks, are there other cases from the armed conflict period, uh, cases of the crimes against humanity, war crimes, that will be affected by the purging of the judges? La pregunta es, si hay otros casos del periodo de conflicto armada, de casos, casos de crímenes de guerra de su humanidad que será afectado también por la este, depuración judicial que se, se impuso. Sí, hay eh, eh, otros casos afectados, eh, aunque el Mozote es el que presentaba el mayor nivel de, de avance en el proceso. Um, yeah, there are other cases that are affected or that have been affected, um, but the Mozote case is the one that has been the most advanced case that's seen in effect. Eh, por ejemplo, el caso de la ejecución eh, de varios periodistas holandeses por el batallón atonal en 1982. For example, the execution of various um, uh, journalists from the Netherlands um, in 19, uh, 19, perdón, 1982, gracias, uh, uh, 1982 um, by the battalion Atona. Yeah. Después de eh, varios años sin apoyo de la fiscalía, Finalmente, el caso se había judicializado eh, en un tribunal salvadoreño por iniciativa de las víctimas y no de la fiscalía. Eh, en este caso también se estaría, se estaría afectando a la jueza por ese decreto. Um, the, without any support from the Attorney General's office, um, this case was finally being recognized by the court. Um, again, and this was with uh, all the initiative of the victims and um, without any support from the Attorney General's office. And this is another case that will be um, impacted by the new, that, by a new judge that's been put in place. Eh, igualmente se nos han reportado que otros, otros casos de masacres que estaban avanzando en exhumaciones eh, en, en sedes judiciales eh, podrían verse afectados por eh, también estar incluidos eh, los jueces que los conocen en, en estos procesos. Other um, massacres that are being based in the exhumation um, of, of remains um, are also being affected by the judges that have been dismissed. Quizá es importante de cara a la reforma aclarar que, que esta reforma eh, prevé que aún si eh, eh, hay jueces que se sometieron al régimen de disponibilidad, eh, tienen su independencia amenazada. Um, it's important to clarify that through this decree, through this advancement, um, the judges that are put on this list of the availability list um, to be relocated, um, their independence is severely compromised. Porque el decreto permite que la Corte pueda trasladar, sustituir o suspender el régimen de disponibilidad de los jueces que se quedaron en cualquier momento. Because the law implies that um, 
the government will be able to move, uh, dismiss, or suspend um, the work of any of the judges um, that are put on this availability list to, to be relocated. Si el juez Guzmán se hubiera quedado, eh, la Corte tenía el pleno poder, según el decreto, de quitarlo en cualquier momento o trasladarlo. No hubiera tenido eh, una estabilidad. Y este es uno de, los, de, la, de las graves afectaciones del decreto eh, de reforma a la ley de la carrera judicial. If uh, Judge Guzman would have stayed in his position under this um, this availability list option that he was presented with, the, they would have had the power to remove him in any moment. Um, he wouldn't have been able to maintain any type of stability. Um, and so this is this has been one of the, the gravest and the most severe effects of the new decree. Uh, for people who are uh, joining us today, Crystal Salvador Salvador has been implementing uh, a mass communication campaign uh, for the last month uh, on Salvador television, uh, billboards, uh, streets, radio ads, uh, calling for solidarity uh, and justice for the victims of El uh, You can follow the campaign on our social media. Uh, the hashtag is justice for El or hashtag solidarity or solidarity. And I mentioned it because we have time for one more question. Uh, and the question is uh, what role can the Salvador youth have to help make visible the case and to advocate in favor of El Mosote cause? Uh, la pregunta is. It's a good question uh, because it's a fourth moment of solidarity. We heard from the victims of Abu Sol today uh, their expressions of solidarity. But how can the Salvador society, how can the youth of the country uh, support the cause? Bien, creo que es, es muy relevante eh, construir eh, estas posibilidades de, de solidaridad porque suponen una reconstrucción del tejido social roto por estas masacres. Um, it's really relevant to construct or create spaces for solidarity because it's a, it's a step towards reconstructing the social fabric that's been, that's been torn by these types of um, massacres. Eh, los gobiernos eh, de El Salvador eh, hasta hoy han tenido eh, políticas de olvido en el tema de memoria histórica y han privado eh, a las juventudes de tener acceso al conocimiento de esta historia y perder con ello un, una oportunidad valiosa para construir la identidad social. Uh, the administrations or the Salvadoran politics up until now have um, run a, a policy of forgetting, of trying to forget um, what has happened and they've really um, they haven't provided youth with the opportunity to to come together and reconstruct the social fabric. Eh, romper esta eh, este esta política de olvido, eh, investigando, conociendo la realidad eh, de las violaciones a derechos humanos durante la guerra, permite a las juventudes acciones de acercamiento eh, a las víctimas, de comprensión. Eh, y como se dice en la pregunta de acciones eh, concretas de solidaridad. Um, breaking with the, the trend of, of forgetting um, means investigating, um, getting to know, um, and getting, getting close to, to the reality. Um, you know, taking actions would, as you know, as the, the question referred to, um, actions would be uh, getting getting close to to the reality of, of what has happened in, in an attempt to create space for solidarity. Eh, me sorprendió que la, la marcha del 15 de septiembre, en la que se expresaron tantos sectores, 
eh, a lo largo de la marcha aparecían eh, carteles recordando el tema del mozote, abran los archivos militares, justicia para el mozote, y que muchos de estos eh, carteles eran portados por jóvenes. Significa que el mozote ha tenido esta capacidad de despertar conocimiento de la historia y solidaridad de alguna manera en la juventud, y que estaban participando públicamente de una actividad y visibilizaba eh, esta injusticia. Um, I was surprised in the protest on September 15th um, that so many different people presented to um, that I saw uh, posters saying posters about El Mozote um, to open the, the archives, um, justice for Mozote. Um, and a lot of these posters were held by young people. Um, and this space has had the, the capacity to, to open those spaces um, and allow young people um, to, to participate and create space for solidarity. La, la apropiación de la juventud, de esta historia de sufrimiento y dolor y eh, su construcción de solidaridad es la mejor garantía de no repetición que podemos tener hacia el futuro. The, the appropriation of this, of this case by, by young people working towards solidarity is the best chance that we have to not repeat this case in the future. We're just about out of time. Uh, I want to thank David for, for his, 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 uh, his time and the careful answering of our questions and our interrogation. Uh, and I want to thank also our communications team our IT, our IT team here in San Salvador and Addy for the translations. Uh, it's not easy work. Uh, and I want to thank you all for the patience as we've tried to develop uh, our technological capacities and, and also do it uh, in a bilingual way. Uh, the solidarity uh, sometimes requires extra patience. Um, one of the uh, phrases, the remarkable phrases, Uh, that Ray Bonner wrote about El Mosotes, he called it a Cold War parable. Uh, he said it was one of the last parables of the Cold War, uh, in a sense emblematic of a, a period of time, the strategies of counterinsurgency, strategies of uh, extermination that David uh, described, but also the geopolitical uh, climate of that time. Uh, and El Mosote, uh, ironically, uh, the case is unfolding Uh, in the context of uh, a reversion back towards authoritarian governance. Uh, the relevance of the case uh, in that sense is that it's a test. It's a test of the theory of transitional justice, that if there isn't truth, if there isn't justice, uh, societies are condemned to repeat the tragedies of the past. Uh, it's also a test of this, the, the justice system today. Uh, it's a test for those exercise, exercising power today, those who would pretend to abuse power. It's a test about accountability. It's a test about the role of the military in a democratic society. Uh, El Mosote, uh, as you heard tonight, is in a critical moment, as is the country, uh, as is in some ways the world. But I think in El Mosote, we also can still find hope. Uh, hope in the historic struggle of the victims uh, that have for 40 years without any real reason to believe that they would be able to have justice nonetheless insisted and insisted. Uh, the victims who with the support of human rights organizations like Cristo Sal or Tutela Legal and with support of people like you who are connected tonight and who have been connected to this case, many of you for decades. Uh, this is the hope, I think, as we now confront patterns of the past, concentration of power, the return of militarism, uh, the, the, the return of authoritarian governance. Uh, this vision of struggle, uh, the sense that or the truth, uh, justice uh, are on our side. David said that the constitution, international law uh, are on our side. Uh, and the sooner or later we will overcome. Uh, in the historic experience of human rights work, oftentimes we don't see the changes that we work for in our times, but nonetheless they're worth struggling for uh, as we contribute to an evolution, uh, evolutionary change in favor of greater respect for
for human dignity and rights. And so that is where we are today. And we're so glad and grateful for you all to be with us. Uh, I don't want to close the night without also remembering one of our dear friends, uh, one of David's oldest colleagues, uh, Wilfredo Medrano. Wilfredo, uh, as a young lawyer, with David was sent out by Maria Udia Hernandez to Amosote to begin to document the case. Uh, he's been uh, a loyal ally of the victims and the survivors, uh, well loved uh, across Morasang, uh, and loved by David uh, and by Christoph Sao. And he passed away uh, this past month uh, as a consequence, consequence of complications of diabetes. So we send our uh, solidarity and love out to his family and to all of you who may have known Wilfredo as well. Uh, I don't want to end on a sad note, uh, so I'll remind us all that there are ways to stay connected and it's important for us uh, to be connected. I think this moment uh, of democratic setbacks, uh, of challenges to the access of historic justice, uh, as we've mentioned today in different ways, it requires increased solidarity, remembering that we're part of a human rights movement, an international human rights movement, uh, and solidarity being an understanding that our rights and dignity, our uh, desire for justice is interconnected and interdependent with the causes of all of us around us. And that is a testimony that the victims of Amosote gave us recently, and that's the one that we hope to follow. The way that we can stay connected uh, is by following uh, Crystal Sal on our social media accounts. We have an English language uh, social media platform as well as an English language uh, website. Also, this content will be available. Uh, I'm looking for the note where they told me where. <laughs> it will be available on YouTube, uh, Facebook, and as well, uh, we will be sending out continued updates uh, if you are on our newsletter list. If you'd like to join our newsletter, you can find that opportunity on our website and fill out your information so that we can stay in touch. I also have to make an ask here at the end. Uh, the ability to sustain litigation at this level uh, by our organization depends on the generosity of our base of supporters like you. Uh, we've been able to sustain uh, litigation as a team of seven people uh, a series present a series of expert witnesses. Uh, sometimes it, we forget it's so normal to us now, uh, but the magnitude of this case, uh, the, the 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 depth of the evidence that's been presented, has not been presented by the state. It's been presented as a part of a collaboration with the victims and the human rights organizations that walk with them. Uh, and your support is what allows us to do that work. This is the largest case that has ever been presented to the Salvadoran criminal justice system. Uh, and that is the result of solidarity and the perseverance of the group of victims who are seeking justice. So thank you again for joining us. David. Gracias, Noah. Gracias a todos por seguirnos esta noche. Thank you, Noah. Thank you.